Hi and welcome to the second lecture on heat transfer. This one is going to cover energy balances. Heat transfer relates to thermodynamics in a number of ways. The first and probably most important way is the conservation of energy. So the first law of thermo thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed in an isolated system. So basically what that means is if you are able to draw boundaries around a certain, um, a certain area of space, energy can come in, energy can go out, it can be generated or um, consumed, it can be accumulated, but it cannot be created or destroyed. So we're going to come up with ways to document how and where um, energy is flowing in these systems that we define. So energy balances throughout this course will be a really critical tool to master. So I want each of you to be really, when you're solving a problem and it requires an energy balance, I want you to really think in this systematic energy balance kind of way. How is energy getting in? How is it going out? If you're able to do that, the energy balance itself will create an equation that you can solve to find various quantities like temperature, for example. Heat transfer also relates to the second law of thermodynamics, which is related to entropy and efficiency. And it's basically saying that no system can be perfectly 100% efficient, and it certainly can't be more than 100% efficient. So it's saying that the entropy of an isolated system is always increasing. So this can be useful when you're doing things like calculating the efficiency of a system. So I, just as a quick example, one way that thermodynamics and heat transfer are related is if you look at a power generation system. So I'm showing you here a steam generation system where you're burning some kind of fuel in a firebox. So you need heat transfer to take that fuel and put it into these tubes where you'd be generating steam. That steam would be used to create power. Um, there'd be another heat transfer process here where you are removing heat. And then this, this cycle continues. This process, you don't just take fuel and convert 100% of that into useful work. You're going to be losing energy along the way, which is how the second law of thermodynamics comes in. So naturally, you're going to be burning a fuel here, but you can't get 100% of that heat into your steam. Some of it's going to be lost because entropy is just being generated. You're not able to, um, and then some of it's going to be lost because you have the effluent and the, this hot um, gas is leaving your system. So there are definitely some really useful relationships between thermodynamics and heat transfer. And I do want to point out this graphic is not from our textbook, so the definitions here don't exactly match up to the ones that I laid out in the last lecture. We'd actually use little q in here to represent a rate of heat transfer, and here we'd use little q out with no dot. Okay, so when you're doing energy balances to solve heat transfer problems, I want each of you to learn how to be an energy accountant. So what does an accountant do? They keep track of how much money are in certain accounts, how much it's coming in, how much is going out, how much might be generated from something like interest or lost from something like um, a de decline, you, you pay interest or something. So we'd, we'll follow these simple steps. So first, we're going to define our system boundaries. So what, how much material is in our system, over what lines is it crossing when it's going in or out of our system. We're going to quantify, okay, how much, if I've defined these boundaries, how much energy is in the system at a given time? That will be our accumulation term. We'll learn to quantify rates. This is where the three rate laws of heat transfer are going to come into play, where we're going to define these in and out terms, which will always be by either conduction, convection, or radiation, or by some, uh, some combination of those three. Our system can also generate thermal energy, so that'll be another term, or it could it could also be consumption. I just use generation because consumption could be just a negative generation. Once we have quantified all of our rates, that'll give us a nice equation, and we can take that equation and use that to solve for the desired quantity. So it's really important to be able to carefully account for all terms. You, if you do this, if you're very carefully accounting for all these things, it'll take very complex problems and turn them into very simple ones. So it's very important to create this system and to get into this mentality of how do I be very systematic about doing this. So accounting could be really simple if you're starting to do use these systems. And just as an example, I'm going to show the world's favorite accountant, Kevin Malone, from The Office. This is one of his systems. Me think, why waste time say lot word when few word do trick? So I put this uh, 
in here to be facetious, but also to point out um, if you can really simplify problems, you can make them easy so that even someone like Kevin Malone could solve these problems. But also, we're going to really work hard to develop systems to really simplify these problems that we're going to be solving. So, if we take some piece of matter, we'll call that our system. Let's say this is a, a part of a wall, or it could be a, a block of air in a room, or it could be a big chunk of solid earth. It could be just about any different um, type of physical space. The first thing to do is decide, okay, what is my system? Is it the air inside of a room, or is it the air inside of a room plus the walls, or is it the entire house, or is it the entire neighborhood? So energy will be conserved in that control volume boundary, no matter how you define that control volume boundary, except you're going to want to learn to define control volume boundaries that will create an equation that will eventually be useful to you. So if you're trying to figure out the temperature inside of an individual room in a house, Having an energy balance over an entire neighborhood probably won't be all that useful to you. However, if you're trying to maybe figure out the total energy consumption of your whole neighborhood, then naturally, yes, you'd want your entire neighborhood to be the system boundary. Coming, So an energy in term, this Q in, would be energy that's flowing across that boundary into our system. There could be multiple terms. There could be multiple different sources of energy coming in. Similarly, we're going to have energy going out, so this could be going out by conduction, by convection, by radiation, or any combination of those three. We could also have generation, so we're talking here about thermal energy. So we, we talked about energy, you can't create it or destroy it, but you can convert it from one form to another. So a generation term could be something like electric generation. So maybe if we're doing a thermal energy balance, and we have this electrical resistance heater in our system. Well, really what's happening is we're converting electrical energy to thermal energy, but our energy balance is only thermal energy. So we would treat that conversion of electrical energy to thermal energy, we'd treat that as a generation term in our system. But there, could, there would be a number of different ways of dealing with that. So some things to remember, as I pointed out, you're the one that defines the system boundary, and that could be whatever, so you want to make sure that you're defining the system boundary so that you'll create an equation that will be useful. And this is something that I think is just going to take up quite a bit of practice. The in and out terms are going to, those are terms that cross the system boundaries, as I mentioned, going in or out. So these are going to come from the three modes, the three different modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. And um, you're going to hear those terms a lot. Definitely commit that to memory. Generation and consumption terms are also rates. So these are this is thermal energy that's generated or consumed in the system. And I will typically just use the term generation. Um, but a consumption term would just be the additive inverse of a generation term. So examples could be electrical resistance heating, or this could also be a chemical reaction where you're converting chemical energy to thermal energy. So rather than trying to deal with an energy balance that extends to a different type of energy, like electrical or chemical, we'll just say our energy balance represents thermal energy and we'll treat any conversion of some other form into thermal energy as a generation term. So what are the different terms of an energy balance? So let's put our accounting hats on. So first we want to think about how is energy being accumulated in our system? So we'll have an accumulation term. So the accumulation term is going to deal with the total amount of energy in our system. How much is there at any given time? We'll certainly have the in term and the out term and then the generation term. So you'll see this form from me quite a bit. So this is part of our, our accounting system. How much is being accumulated, how much is coming in and going out, and then how much is being generated or consumed. So in a particular system, your accumulation term might look like this, DE, DT. I'm using E to just represent the total amount of thermal energy in our system. That could also be DU, DT. So how much energy total is in our system? How much is coming in? So that would be our in term. You could have multiple in terms. How much is going out? Similarly, you could have multiple out terms and then generation. So. I want you to stop and think, for this particular form of the energy balance, what units should each term have? And if you want to think about this a little bit, you can hit the pause button and think about it. All right, so you'll notice that each of these is a rate, a rate of change of 
energy. So that would have units of, of watts. So ultimately, we're going to be taking each of these terms and adding and subtracting them. So you can't, um, it's like an apples and oranges thing, you have to have everything being in the same units if you want to add them together. So this is an, a very important thing to learn to do as part of your energy accounting system. Once you've laid out your terms like this, you're going to want to make sure that each term has the right units. So in the way I've set this up, each of these terms would have units of watts. So again, I mentioned this is the rate of change form of an energy balance. So we're basically saying how fast is our system accumulating energy, how fast is energy coming in and out and being generated. And we definitely want to make sure that those all have units of watts. So the way to set up this energy balance, um, you have accumulation equals, so what's coming in, anything coming in is going to add to our accumulation term. So we'd expect this in term to be a positive term, although there may be instances where it's not, and we'll cover those eventually. So we have what's coming in minus what's going out, and then we have plus what is being generated in our system, and this will form the basis for our energy balance equation, and it will look something like this. We just take those terms, accumulation equals in minus out plus generation. It will be important to very carefully document um, how you've set up your, your rate law, and then you always want to make sure you're subtracting out the out term. So you might set this up so that your out term is a positive term, but you're losing that much energy, so it, when you put it into equation form, you want to make sure you get that minus sign in there. I want to stress it's very important to make sure that you go through very carefully when you're defining your system boundaries and setting up these rates that you have a really good conceptual grasp of what's happening in your system. If you have that conceptual grasp, it'll be much easier to detect when you have some kind of an error in your equation. Okay, so many of the problems we will solve in this class, this will be the most common form of an energy balance that we'll use, so that's the one I'm showing you here is this rate of change form. The problems that, there will be problems that we solve that don't necessarily require an energy balance. I would call these rate problems. So sometimes we'll, there may be a problem that'll just ask you how fast is energy leaving or how fast is it coming in or how fast is it being generated. In that case, we'll use those laws of heat transfer to figure out the in and the out terms. Generation term is usually a little bit simpler. So there may be some problems that are just what's the rate and we'll just use that rate. Um, these rate equations are going to come from the three different modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. And in the next few lectures, we'll teach, we'll introduce these different forms in more detail and start talking about the rate laws or the equations that are going to tell us how fast energy is coming in or out. While this sounds really simple, this looks like a really si simple system, and I hope you're all staying with me, you can expand this system to become something much more powerful. So you're going to take those accounting skills and your very simple and clear system, and you could expand that to be to cover thousands or millions of different energy balances. So this is this could be used to do to generate one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional heat maps. So this picture here is a three-dimensional heat map, and the way that you would solve a system like this is to take that big chunk of material and divide it up to thousands or even millions of different tiny little control volumes. Each one of those control volumes is going to be coupled with an energy balance equation and then by solving all of those equations simultaneously you can get this really detailed and complex heat map. You can do this same kind of thing to do something like model a heat exchanger. We're going to cover heat exchangers in chapter 11, um, but if you can use very sophisticated software to give you changes in temperature um, in addition to flow, which is where fluid mechanics would come in, to come up with very complex models to understand how your design might perform, or you could use this to detect where something is going wrong in your system. You can also add in transient analysis, so you can model very complex systems like a solar thermal power plant and capture how a bunch of different components of that plant are changing over time. So I really want to emphasize that while I tried to present a very, very simple energy balance in the last few slides, you can take that same concept and really without adding too much complexity, you can model amazingly complex systems. And actually these are, can become really fun problems to solve.
So tips for being a good energy accountant. Take the time to really digest the concepts. Take the time to set up your system boundaries, to identify the Q-in and Q-out terms, the generation terms and the accumulation terms. So if you're doing that, you're already breaking that down into very simple parts. You're taking something that could be complex and learning to break it down into really simple pieces. And then you can use something like computer software to solve a very complex system like those that you're seeing here on the right. So be very careful and very organized. And if you set this up well and are very systematic about it, then you can take very complex problems and, and plug that into a system like computer software to solve a much more complicated system. So I mentioned the, the energy balance we did before was for a control volume. We thought about our space or that matter as a three-dimensional object. Well, you could also do this on a two-dimensional object, so by doing a surface energy balance. So let's say that we have a wall system here. You'll learn later this is called a plane wall, and we have this solid surface bumping up against this fluid. So we're going to have conduction, um, heat flowing through our solid. We'll learn about these different modes soon. So we'll have conduction coming in and convection leaving. So it may be useful for us to just look at this plane here and this would basically be just a, a planar system. It has no volume where energy could come in and go out. These will be another form of energy balance that could be really useful to us. So if we use that basic form, accumulation equals in minus out plus generation. Let's just look at our different terms. So here are the same terms. I'm keeping this really simple. We're going to go through later and quantify these terms in more detail. Our accumulation term would be zero for a surface energy balance, and that is because our, it's just a two-dimensional system. It has no volume. It can't accumulate anything because it has no really physical space to accumulate something. It's just a two-dimensional plane. It could certainly still have an in term. In this case, I've specified that in term is coming in by conduction, so I'm using Q subscript cond, or Q by conduction coming into my system. And then I would have Q leaving my system by convection. And if you don't know what those terms mean yet, don't worry, we're going to cover them in the next lectures. This system would also have zero generation. At least in this course, we're going to mostly be dealing with volumetric generation terms. So if our system has no volume, it will not be able to generate energy. If there's no physical actual space to deal with because it's only two-dimensional and flat, then there would be no room to have generation. But certainly there may be other ways of thinking about that. All right, so coming up, we are going to learn how to quantify each of these terms in more detail. So the thermal mass we'll use for the accumulation term. That's going to have terms, units of, of density, of heat capacity, and of change in temperature with time. We're going to use these heat transfer rate laws, which I'll introduce in the next lectures, to quantify our in and out terms. And then the generation term, as I've mentioned, is usually fairly simple the way we'll deal with it. There will usually be some kind of mathematical equation to plug in there. So we've learned how to do an energy balance, or at least how to start thinking about an energy balance. So what heat transfer is going to teach us really well is how do we document these different flow of heat terms. I have tried to put this energy balance into f terms that are very simplistic. So um, just a single algebraic term, this does look very simple. But eventually we're going to put in terms where each of these are temperature dependent. We'll have more algebra and calculus going into each of these terms that will give us more complicated equations. In fact, much more complicated in some instances. But it still comes down to this very basic system of the energy balance and then quantifying and documenting the rates. I want to warn you, there will be ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations that we'll be solving throughout the semester. All of these are going to start with just an energy balance. So. Take a deep breath, make sure you grasp the concepts, so really take time to understand those really simple fundamentals, because understanding those simple fundamentals and having a good system will make us be able to solve much more complex problems later. So the solution methodology just take a little bit of practice and repetition. I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes by Ralph Waldo Emerson that I frequently repeat to my students and my own children. That which we persist in doing becomes easier for us to do. Not that the nature of the thing is changed, but that our ability to do is increased. I want to end this lecture by just talking about how do you solve problems. You try to keep them simple. Start very simple. Make sure you understand the simple concept. Um, then only once you've grasped that should you expand to start thinking about more complex problems. 
I would strongly advise against trying this plug and play or plug and chug method. It just it probably to me would mean that you're not grasping the concept. You should be able to define your own system, your own control volume, and you should be able to quantify the in and out terms in that system and then solve the equation. And as you work toward doing that, I think you will find that you'll gain a, a deeper and much greater understanding of heat transfer.